Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, I'm Alison Larkin, writer, comedian, narrator, and host of The Jane Austen Podcast. Join me as we embark on a journey through Austen's timeless stories, starting with Pride and Prejudice. The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, world. Welcome back to another episode of Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. Y'all, we are five days away from the election, or shall I say from the end of the election, because it's supposed to end that day, although we all know it'll probably take a couple more days. However, I'm going to say it's the end of it on on the third, because so many of y'all have already been out there voting. I'm particularly proud of the 18 to 29 year old demographic who's been out there rallying hard, voting in numbers we haven't seen. It's great. Super proud of you guys. Remember, if you have a mail in ballot, don't mail it in. Not at this point. It's a little too late. You walk that ride into your polling place, take it to a ballot drop off box. Those locations should have been with your ballot. But if you have questions, look on your state's website. They should have information. Just get those votes in. I'm stoked. Been looking at what I'm going to make for the election day. I got some blue cocktails going that I think I'm going to make. Maybe some um, cupcakes in ice cream cones for Joe. You know, maybe that's it. Also, happy Halloween, guys. It's usually my favorite time of year. And while it was still, you know, fun to virtually celebrate. Um, I do miss all of the fun things like the haunts and Halloween Horror Nights and all of the great stuff that you get to do during Halloween season. I usually go and see my best friend on the East Coast and we go to pumpkin patches and obviously we didn't do that this year because of COVID. But I hope you have a great Halloween. I hope you stay very safe I hope you remember to wear your mask. And yeah, what are you going to be? I thought about dressing up just at home because why the hell not, you know? Last year, I was Sydney from Scream. My hair has been doing some weird things. It keeps on turning different colors every time I wash it. So maybe this year I'll be Tatum from Scream because it's kind of in that style right now. Who knows? Anyway, have a great Halloween. Happy election. So much going on this next week. I'm stoked. Today on the show, we have uh, one of the coolest people I know by far, David Dostomalchian. You know him from Ant-Man, Twin Peaks, Blade Runner, MacGyver, The Dark Knight, his movies, Animals, and All Creatures Here Below, which are fantastic films, and you should go watch them if you haven't seen them. And of course, he's about to star in Dune and Suicide Squad. I mean, the guy's killing it. He's a super cool guy, and uh, you know, I just love getting to talk to him. He's what I like to call the Halloween king of Hollywood. He has the best Halloween parties. You'll hear us talk about that a little bit. And uh, he's just one of the most genuine people I know, and I'm very happy he's on the show this week. So here's my conversation with David. Do it. Hey, David. Welcome to the show. Hi, buddy. It's good to hear your voice. I can't believe I haven't seen you in so long. It's crazy. I know. The Halloween king can't have his Halloween party, and I'm very upset. (laughs) <laughs> that's okay i am feeling very optimistic we have lived through the apocalypse this year next year the halloween party i'm gonna triple quadruple down you're gonna your mind is gonna be blown and i really think so next stoked. year it's gonna be a great year for all of us i'm trying to just hold on to this feeling of optimism and hope that i have in my heart right now that we're gonna be it's gonna be a group it's gonna be a better year next year 
I'm hoping so. I mean, I know last year everyone was like, man, 2019 sucked. 2020 is going to be our year. And now it's like, okay, really, guys, we really need 2021 to be the year. <laughs> yes. And I believe it. I believe it's possible. I think we're turning some corners. And I, you know, obviously I don't get to see you in real life because it's been, you know, uh, this whole quarantine process and everything. Mm-hmm. But I, um, but I'm, I'm grateful that we have technology and social media and ways we could stay in touch. And I'm glad you're doing this podcast. And um, yeah, man, it's uh, it's great to be be back together and talking again. I know. I You know what's crazy? I realized that I've now known you for almost just over eight years. And to me, that's wow. bizarre. That's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, yeah, we first met we were complete strangers cast opposite one another in a uh a, a vampire <laughs> film that never saw the light of day but the, one of the great things about that experience was that i got to make friends with you and and ricky as well i've stayed in yeah. touch with ricky and um but i think you know you and i have continued to to stay close for years and we've come close to collaborating again and and i know it's going to happen at at some it will. point and we're doing it right now we are like yeah we are collaborating but i um i loved working with you so much in that and you Aww. were um i mean you were a baby you were i you was. still are but you were a baby <laughs> and, and i was playing this creepy terrifying vampire <laughs> that oh my god came into really my funny. room at night <laughs> so weird wow I know. I think I was, I was 20, I think when we did that. Yeah, I was 20. I was a baby. I have to see if at least Ricky will get us some stills and some photographs of that. Cause I'm, I would love to share that at Halloween time. I've got pictures of my makeup from that time, but I don't Mm. have any, um, any stills of like you and I together. That would be really cool. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I might have some, I feel like somebody sent them to me. I'll, I'll go through my files and see if I have any that I can send to you. Yeah, like you had blood all over at one point yeah. and then you totally like... The vomit on one side as well. Yes. I had the vomit on one side and the blood on the other. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you killed me. I want that yeah. picture. That was I awesome. Know. That was yeah. great. With that fun little like twist that we did, the um, the stunt that we had to, to do when yeah. it was like... 30 degrees out <laughs> oh my god yeah so and cold. you were really sick do you remember oh my gosh now I we're was. just doing a walk down memory lane but i just remembered. i was super sick i felt really bad for you because you were like sh- shaking and like you had a really bad uh cold or flu and um we had to like get pretty close and i was like i felt really bad for you but i was also worried that i was gonna catch whatever you had. i know <laughs> like hey i'm sick do you want to make out i don't know <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, the good times. They were. Um, So tell me, you know, I've discovered on this podcast that I know so many people in the industry and so many people that I'm friends with, but I don't know how they got their start, which I think is kind of bizarre. So what got you into acting? Sure. I grew up in Kansas in um, the suburbs of Kansas City, and I was always entranced by movies and theater. And my mom took me to see my sister in a high school production when I was very little of um, the mousetrap, it scared the pants off me, but I loved it. And then I was just this big fan of the Muppets and everything. I got on stage in kindergarten to sing a song, forgot the lines, ran (laughs) off stage, swore I'd never do it again. But, (laughs) you know, over time, my mom kept, you know, taking me to plays. And I used to love watching, especially like speaking of vampires, like creature features and horror movies when I was a kid. And so I, the summer after my parents' divorce, I was really very down, very depressed and, and, Mm. and, and it was really bad time for me. And I was only in, you know, going into sixth grade, but boy, it Mm. was dark. And my, I said to my mom, I don't want to play baseball. I didn't like playing baseball. The guys that were on my team weren't nice to me. I said, I don't want to play baseball. She said, that's fine. You don't have to play baseball, but you have to do something. So she took me and I, I wanted to audition for a community theater play which I did and got in the chorus of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Oh yeah. And um, continued to do plays at school. And then, um, you know, like a lot of people, I, I wanted to go and study further in college, um, Mm. but I didn't think it was realistic that I could go study acting. So I was um, pursuing a football scholarship uh in college and a I, football scholarship yeah, i'm sorry I, was, I don't think you can hear this but my mouth just dropped <laughs> to the floor. I, i'm gonna send you a picture but my senior year of high school i was 220 pounds i was a 
relatively decent, successful high school football what? athlete. And I was um, talking to a couple of colleges. But here's the thing. My brother was a collegiate basketball player. And mm. I knew the commitment, the time, what it required to do that. And I was also a really apprehensive because by the time I finished my senior year football season, I was kind of done. I was like, I loved football, but I was also like, it, I did, it wasn't my passion. My passion mm. had be, becoming storytelling, writing and acting. And thank yeah. God for teachers. A couple of my teachers talked to my coach even, and they collaborated to help me get out of practice early to work on some auditions. Wow. And I auditioned for a program, a theater training program in Chicago. I not only got accepted, I got the scholarship I needed. And that's when I started my my journey. I, 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 I went to De- DePaul's Theater School, which is an incredible um, training program. And I um, I studied very, very hard there. And then, um, yeah, that started wow. my path. Yeah. I, I still can't get over the football thing. <laughs> Just try to imagine you playing football. It doesn't make sense in my head. Isn't it crazy? I see, I, I see Crow- Count Crawley, you know, I don't see football. <laughs> you know what? I was sneaking out to, um, I mean, I was very committed to my team and to playing, especially my senior year, because there was so much riding on the line. But I was also in student government, which you probably wouldn't believe. Nice. I was a the, the president of my senior class. And see, I could see that. I could see that. Okay, well, in order to fulfill my duties as president of the senior class, I had to do a fundraiser for the project graduation, which was like a students against drunk driving night to celebrate graduation. So to raise the money, I came up with this idea. I'm so I was crazy back then, but I can't (laughs) that we could turn the entire high school into a haunted house, which people would pay to come. We, we got, I mean, we had the fire, uh, marshal came because I, I, <laughs> me and my friends, we filled that place with so much stuff. I don't know how they let us do it and how we didn't cause massive damage to the high school, but it was incredible. The news came and like, so I was, I was obsessed even back then. And I of wow. course played the count, um, and toured people through the haunted house. That was my job. I was one of the tour guides, but it was, uh, we raised like 30. Five hundred dollars. I want. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's, that's pretty great. great. Yeah, I know it was awesome. Wow. So you go to DuPaul's, is that right? And then, and yeah. then what? Do you come so out to LA? I was, I was in Chicago. I, I I finished the theater conservatory program, and and you know, going back to that fifth sixth grader who was struggling with depression, that mm-hmm. that battle was never addressed properly. And and I and I speak openly about this, but he, as young as 12 years old, I d- had my first like, really dangerous ideation and note mm-hmm. writing about suicide. And I was wrestling with which I think is a combination of both the trauma of a messy divorce by my parents, a the trauma of all of my older siblings all of a sudden being out of the house, the mm. the trauma of having a very um, abusive alcoholic grandfather, the mm. the biological and chemical genetics that I was born with. You know, there's there's yeah. so much that goes into play with depression, but it was never addressed properly. And sadly, when I got to Chicago, the stress of the training that I was doing. I was, I didn't have any healthy outlets. So I was a full time Mm. addict and alcoholic. And I found um, opioids when I was uh, like a freshman in college. And I was able to be a very successful, you know, I got good grades in college. Mm -hmm. I I was in almost every play that we put up. I was very committed to the art, but I was also a functioning opioid addict. And by the time I got out of theater school, I was on this path where like agents were recruiting and I was, you know, getting some opportunities, but I, the bottom just dropped out and I kind Mm. of dropped off the scene for quite a while. And I was a full-time heroin addict and went through a really, really dark and near death um, battle with both addiction and depression. And by the grace of God and by many miracles, uh, I was able to get clean and sober, which mm-hmm. when, so, so then let's fast forward to now I'm in my mid twenties, mm-hmm. but when I got sober, I was afraid of going back to acting because I thought the stress or the pressure of that. So I just lived a very simple oh. so, sober life for about three or four years 
And then a friend of mine put me back in a, um, he really encouraged me. I was working at a movie theater uh, and I was working at a call center and writing a lot and just kind of keeping my head down and, and, and living my life. And, and yeah. I was so grateful that I just hadn't died, you know? And um, right. so my friend Jimmy and my friend Jen, both, they, they pulled me back onto the stage and I ended up realizing that I not only could do it without the support of drugs or alcohol, but that I was a better actor than I had been before, that I had much more fun with the work mm. and I enjoyed it. And another, by the grace of God moment, that one of the very first things I did, turns out a casting director came to see the show, brought mm. me in. I, I booked a, uh, a national commercial. This is in 2006, which afforded me the ability to become a quote unquote full-time actor where I was doing just theater and commercials. And then about wow. eight months after that, I got to audition for a tiny role in um, The Dark Knight, which was shooting in Chicago. And so that, good. that ended up being the big break that kind of launched my journey into my dream, which was always yeah. work in television and, um, and film. And you've had quite the extensive career after that. I mean, The Dark Knight really put you on the map. So did you move to LA after the dark night and said, Hey, I'm not I'm long. here. I'm ready. Yeah. Not long. I knew I wanted to go to LA. My instinct said to go to LA. It's funny. The agents that I was with at the time and other friends of mine were like, you're going to hate LA. You're not, you're, you're, <laughs> you should stay in Chicago. You should go to New York. But I've always listened to my gut and my instincts. And there was something that always drew me to LA. I used to listen to the way that David Lynch talked about Los Angeles and, and the mm. magical spell that it cast over him. And I, um, I had this, and I knew well enough that the business originates in Hollywood. It's called I mean, yeah. Hollywood for it's reasons. Hollywood. So I thought, like, I would like to get to the to the to the actual playing field and see what I can make happen for myself. So I, luckily, I mean, The Dark Knight was a life changing experience. But yeah. between shooting it, which I didn't get, you know, I think I made scale, so that was enough to float me for another couple of months. But I uh -huh. thankfully this director who I love named Chris Smith had booked almost all my national commercials. He always cast me. And so we, I signed on to do a run of um, Wendy's commercials. Nice. Which we're going to shoot in New York. And I was like, this is my opportunity to live in New York because we would shoot every few weeks. So I just mm -hmm. had a really great apartment with my friend, Paul, and we would shoot these commercials. And then I was able to go on you know, auditions. I was writing a lot. I was yeah. doing a lot of making short films with my friends, creating and writing plays and, 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 mm -hmm. and stuff with my friends. And I knew when that time ended, I was going to use all that money I'd saved doing these commercials to get my buns to LA. And I did it. <laughs> I, I, I went to see my mom and stepdad for Christmas in Kansas in 2010. I bought a, uh, a used, uh, a used Dodge Alero with yes. like 4,500 cash. <laughs> I drove to LA and, um, and, and that, that was it. And, and that was it 2010. So I'm celebrating now my 10th year in uh city of angels. Oh my gosh. Happy 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how long until you started writing animals? Because I remember seeing that film not, not long after I met you and just being totally blown away one by your acting. Cause you're incredible, but your writing too, is just stunning. I love you. Thank you for saying that. I, so when I wasn't acting and I was working at the call center and I was working at the movie theater, I was determined that if I never got to get back on stage or in front of a camera, I was going to write. And so I was writing and I've, it's always been a practice of mine to write down my goals and to write down my ideas and try to journal as much as I can. And the first, some, you know, I'd always read because I was reading like how to write a screenplay books and save the mm -hmm. cat and all of the, yes. you know, <laughs> save all, the cat, those all those books. things. And they always say, you know, write what you know. That doesn't mean you have to write literally what you know, but you need to write about themes, questions, things that are important to you and find, you know, to, to a way to infuse them into the story. And I, yeah. and I had been through a, and was going through a really tumultuous relationship. I dealt with a lot of guilt over having, you know, been a, a white male of privilege who still ended up, you know, squandering his opportunities and becoming an addict. I was dealing with just so many feelings uh, that I didn't know how to, to, to write into a script. And I thought, well, why not write a fictional, you know, but, but, but based all on my own 
experience yeah. journey of these two people who are in love, who are at that place where it's like, do we stick this thing out together and, 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 and survive? Or is there a point where sometimes you have to get on your lifeboat and, and swim off into the mm -hmm. distance? And so I, I started working on the script and it, I wrote and rewrote and would ask friends for notes and wrote and rewrote. So I started writing it in 2006, probably on notebook paper. Wow. And then I learned about how to do, I was trying to write it in word documents and then, and then centering and aligning was so strange. <laughs> and then I figured out the magic of final draft. And by, yeah. the, time, by the time we went to go make the movie, I was, I think I was in the 76th, 77th draft of the Holy screenplay. Crap. And that guy, by the way, who Chris Smith, who had put me in all those commercials, who's given mm -hmm. me so many great opportunities. He had directed a film called American movie, which had been a big winner at Sundance. And he was mm. just one of my heroes. Chris read the script. And when he said, you got to make this, I'll help you. I knew what? I had to do it. So he, really encouraged me. He put his name on everything. He gave wow. us um, post-production facilities at his offices in Milwaukee. And then Colin Shifley, one of my best friends who I mm -hmm. had met in Chicago, he uh, had a great vision for the film. And we went and privately raised, you know, through $5,000 increments, uh, mm -hmm. $180,000. We had a couple of really great big investors, one for yeah. 80 and one for 50, but we had a number of five thousand dollar investment as well. <laughs> I've been and, there. Um, Micro budget yeah. films, man. <laughs> yeah. But we did it. And I'm I'm so proud and they, and I, I you always uh, are so complimentary about it. But that's one of my proudest accomplishments as a storyteller is is that film. And it it won so many accolades and it went to so many places. I mean you premiered at South by, is that right? Yeah, yeah. We went we went to South that's, by it was amazing. so weird. We finished the we finished shooting in um in uh, September of, at the end of September of 2013, Eve and I had found out weeks before, we were engaged, but we weren't married mm -hmm. yet. We found out weeks before that she was pregnant and we were like, oh my gosh, we were broke. <laughs> I had at that point, like three grand in our combined checking. Um, yeah. We were not taking any income while we were making animals. I think we were having to pay ourselves like a hundred dollars a day, which was getting funneled. And then put it back home. into, yeah. <laughs> but by... Again, the incredible luck, miracle, grace of God, however people listening choose to look at it. Um, I mean, you can't discount the power of luck in this business sometimes. Mm -hmm. a, mo a movie that I had auditioned for and booked and had worked on called Prisoners had come out while we were filming. So we go back to LA and I'm scrambling thinking, I'm about to be a dad. I need to actually yeah. make some money. I need to get on some you know, good commercial auditions. I need to figure something out. Well, Colin was cutting, um, and the movie and, and, and getting it ready. And I, um, and when I got back to LA, that movie prisoners had had a really great response. And so mm -hmm. some really good job offers started to float in. And that led to me getting to audition for the Ant-Man movie. So fast forward now to, um, April of 2014, we we submitted a very rough cut of animals to South by Southwest, just thinking like at least we'll get some feedback, maybe we'll hear. Yeah. And and they immediately wrote back and were like, "We love this movie. Who are you guys? Um, we would love to get, you know." And we were like, "Oh my god!" So then we had to rush. <laughs> what is and happening? Really like cut and sound mix, and then we had to raise a little more money to get the the, the finishing done on the film. Mm -hmm. It was such an amazing time, Jillian. Like I was at South by Eve was eight months pregnant. She insisted oh on going. So she's <laughs> driving me and Colin around in this van oh that we God. rented. And then, and then Disney calls and is like, we need you to come test for the Ant-Man movie. So they flew me from Austin back to LA to have my like camera test with Paul Rudd and Michael Pena. And at that point, Edgar Wright was directing the film and mm. um, Edgar had heard about animals because the casting director, uh, Sarah Finn, for all the Marvel movies, she had been at South by Southwest and she oh my had gosh. become a fan of my work through that. So it all just worked out in this really fairy tale dream way that like the movie did get this great premiere. We won the 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 the, the, the Courage and Storytelling Jury mm -hmm. Prize and it got bought by Oscilloscope, which is a company I always loved. And then I was still so afraid of money. Mm -hmm. Um being that I was my son was born like just a few weeks after um 
after South by. And, so wild. And it's crazy that I landed that Ant Man job, which was the first time I'd ever since doing those Wendy's commercials. It was the first mm-hmm. time I had seen like, like significant money. paycheck. Yeah. yeah, where I was like, oh, so I don't have to stress about rent for two months. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm good for a few months. Yeah, yeah, we're I'm gonna be bad. all right. We're gonna be okay. And it and it and and Eve has always said that to me. And and the people with wisdom. You know, my mom, who we lost recently, always mm-hmm. said this to me. Uh, people that I love and who I trust and who are spiritual centers for me have always said, like, because I can be a worrier and I can, I can distract myself with frivolous, unnecessary anxieties about things that I just don't have any control over. And they've always mm-hmm. said to me, like, and Eve always said it. She's like, David, I wasn't worried for a second. It always, it always works out. He always provides. Mm-hmm. It always ends up being okay. We always land on our feet. And, um, Yeah. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. (laughs) Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow... Grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. It's true. I've always had that weird thing, too, where I'll I'll start freaking out for a moment about money. And then I'm like, I don't know how it works, but somehow I always get it, get things done. So it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to spend my time thinking about it. I'm going to figure out ways to actually go make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could sit here and talk literally all day about everything you've done between like Blade Runner and Twin Peaks and Bird Box and now Dune and Suicide Squad. I mean, it's like you exploded. And it's so freaking cool to watch it. Uh, <laughs> like, I love it. So um, it's it's amazing. It's amazing what you've been able to do and all the things that have come your way. Um, and I'm super proud to know you. But I also want to talk about all creatures here below because you got back together with Colin to make that. And yeah. it's another really special movie that everyone needs to watch. Thank you. So so we were going to promote animals um we were on sitting you know crammed in the back of um a very crowded plane me and colin and eve this was um and we had arlo with us we were going to go to new mexico for a film festival to show the movie this is 
maybe four or five months after South by Southwest. So we're on our way to the, um, to the uh, a really wonderful film festival that was um, uh, raising funds for, um, for people struggling with substance abuse and addiction. Mm. And, um, Oh, I, I'm mad at myself that I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but maybe we'll <laughs> put it in the, in the, in the details of the podcast. Later. The but anyway, yeah. so I, we get on the plane and I had been living with this idea, this script for years about, um, to me, a journey that in many ways reflected my love for, you know, Gothic Americana and the, the work of mm. John Steinbeck, like of Mice and Men, but I wanted to play with some role reversal um, between the, you know, the characters. I wanted to make a story about love, even love that is, that is technically what people would regard as wrong and how love can grow out of trauma in the, in the worst and darkest places. And like I said earlier in the podcast, you know, my, my grandfather was an alcoholic and, and, and sadly very abusive individual who, Mm was not just, you know, um, verbally or physically abusive. He was also uh, sexually abusive. And the trauma that that inflicted upon the family was something that just lived buried underneath um, decades of uh, soil for all of us and continued to cause, you know, really damaging harm upon people that I, my family and and myself. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, forget about it. I'm not going to hide from this anymore. I've written about, you know, subjects that are embarrassing or that, that, that are hard for me in the past. I'm going to do it with this and we'll see what comes out. I wrote an 85 page script in like 24 hours. I'm not kidding. It just poured out of me because it had been living in my heart. I think for so long, Colin and Eve, who are my hardest critics, they both read it. They both said, we got to go make this movie. Thank God we found this uh, incredible EP named Nacho Arenas, who's also a writer and um, Mm. producer, and he wanted to finance the film. He loved the script. He didn't have barely any notes. Um, Karen Gillan read the script and said, I mean, she was coming off of Guardians making kudos, millions of dollars, and she was like... I want to come be in your film. I love this script. She loved animals. She, I had not met her before that time, but I wow. had mu- mutual friends who said that she was a badass. And so she really <laughs> was. And she came and she brought all of her creative, uh, you know, tornado of, of, of just incredible brilliance to the film and, mm. and uh, blew us away. And, and we made the film, um, it's so weird how the cycles of my life work uh, because then soon after that, we found out then that we're going to have Penny, which is our <laughs> second child. My so daughter. just every time you make a film, you're going to have yeah. another kid. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we, we had some, some difficult uh, moments with um, it, it's a really hard film and people who yeah. end up watching this film will understand why we, some of the film festivals that we were in conversations with, you know, were we'd get like, a, a, a programmer who would say we're really interested in this film but we have to you know they would they were having arguments which i i thought was mm. a good a good sign that the film was yeah. causing some people to really love it's causing it. a reaction people, yeah some people hated um but ultimately we got to premiere at the um, downtown los angeles film festival and then sam goldwyn films which had made so many incredible films over the years and then distributed so many incredible films over the years uh bought the film which was such a great honor for me and Mm. um you know when you know what it's like when you work on these labors of love that the just the dream of getting like a company like that to want to put their their little any company at the end of the day you're like excuse me what (laughs) you like it great Yeah, yeah and um and so yeah I hope if anybody you know gets a chance they'll um they'll check it out yeah everybody should go go watch animals and then watch all creatures here below have a david day Yay. <laughs> um, okay. So on my show, I have actors tell me uh, about stories about, you know, roles they almost got or funny auditions or bad auditions. Is there a story that you'd like to share with the audience? I have two. Okay. One is, um, they're important stories. I, I, I think they're good to, to, to share with people. Um, one of them is it was a bad experience, but it's funny mm. now looking back on it. When I I had already shot my role in 
The Dark Knight. It had not Mm -hmm. come out yet. I was in Chicago still. I was doing a wrapping up a production of, it was either the glass menagerie or no, no, no. I was, I had, I had, you know, I, I I need to correct myself. Okay. (laughs) So it's April of 2007. I had auditioned for the Dark Knight. The part mm. that I auditioned for was one of the clowns at the beginning of the film. And oh. um, and so they had shot that scene. So I had been devastated to realize that I did not mm. get, get the role, right? I, mm-hmm. I was really sad. So about a month later, but I was in, I had just started uh, uh, rehearsals for a really um, powerful production of Othello at the Writers Theater in Chicago. So I was going to be doing that for the next couple of months. So I kind of licked my wounds. I'm a, you know, huge comic yep. nerd. So whenever I had time off, I was sneaking down and trying to get pictures at the man <laughs> set. And like, I was still like, you know, but I was, I was sad that I didn't get the part. And, and about a month later, I got um, a last minute audition. I had to leave. We were in like tech week for Othello. Oh, I had to leave a little bit early to go without this was before cell phones and PDFs were sent. You mm-hmm. had to like go pick up your sides, you know, somewhere. Oh my God. Yes. And it was for a new Larry the Cable Guy movie. And I drove for, I, from this audition or from my, my, my tech rehearsal at the theater. And it was a nighttime audition. They were squeezing me in at the very end. Wow. I was racing through traffic to get to this Larry the Cable Guy audition. It wasn't at one of the regular casting director's offices. It was just, they had pre-production rented an office somewhere Mm -hmm. in downtown in Chicago. So I get there, I get to the lobby, I sign in, I get the the sides. Mm -hmm. And because of my last name, one of the struggles I faced in Chicago, especially for film and television, almost any audition I got was either for a terrorist or (laughs) a, um, like a cab driver uh, yeah. I was only given auditions for film and television by like ethnic characters. That wasn't true oh, for gosh. the co- the commercial casting director, but for the rest of casting directors. And I always <laughs> kind of was frustrated because yes, my, you know, my last name is Iranian. My dad was born in Iran, but I mm-hmm. am a blend of Irish, Italian, Iranian, English. Like I don't define myself by any right. Um, particular, uh, you know, nationality or race. So Mm -hmm. I always wanted to get to audition for these other roles. And it's, isn't it ironic that it took John Papsidera, LA casting director, who everyone said LA was so surface, who comes to Chicago and he's the person that cast me in a non-ethnic role in a movie. (laughs) But anyway, so this Larry the Cable Guy audition, I look at the sides and I immediately get that sick feeling in my stomach. Here's the scene. The scene is a motel clerk who owns a motel who has who is written to have a pretty goofy, uh, silly dialect. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that they they were like non specifically some, you know, uh, Indian or Pakistani type of character, right? And then Larry the Cable Guy is going to walk in to get a room. And I say, you can't get a room without a credit card. He doesn't have a credit card. And we go back and forth about how if you don't have a credit card, you can't get a room. So then he pulls out this fake badge and says he's with the Department of Homeland Security. Oh, and God. if I don't give him a room, then uh, he's going to have to call his bosses. And then, of course, the joke is I immediately hand him a stack of towels and like some <sighs> some, some key cards or whatever. Yeah. So I walk into the room. And the people there, I don't remember who it was. It's probably the director, the producers. Uh, Larry the Cable Guy was not there. But um, mm. they, you know, uh, were nice enough. But I, my heart was not in it. And I wanted yeah. to just leave. And I said, um, you know, he said, well, uh, we heard you were, maybe we heard you were coming from somewhere. And I said, um, yes, I'm in the middle of tech week for, um for Othello. And, um, I did a take of this, of this scene and I just felt so gross. And then I said, um, I have to get back to, to tech rehearsal. I, didn't, <laughs> I couldn't do, uh, I couldn't do it again. And I, and yeah. I left and it was, um, and when I left, I said, I don't want this. I don't want to be, I don't want to do this. Um, right. I, I just, it's, it's not right for me. And 
thank goodness, you guys, uh, you know, um, three months later, Othello closes in July. Don't forget my first audition, my only audition for The Dark Knight, except for my, my, I had auditioned on one day in April and the next day come in for a callback with the director. Um, mm-hmm. That was in the beginning of April. In wow. July, we Jeez. closed Othello. I had no work lined up. I was very stressed. <laughs> And my agent called and said, you've been offered a role in The Dark Knight. They don't, it's oh my a gosh. secret role. They won't say what it is, um, but, you know, yada, yada, yada. So that's, I think it's a great story for actors to hear because you just, you have to listen to your, to your gut. You have to yeah. trust your, your instinct. And um, sometimes we, it's our jobs as actors to force or to, to find ourselves in the material and to say yes to opportunities. I have always believed you should say yes to opportunities Mm -hmm. because you never know what can come of the opportunities, but there are times when you really have to listen to your heart and your gut and then go, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's definitely been roles where it's just, you read it and you're just like, Oh, I don't, I can't, I don't want to be a part of that. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Yep. Oof, duh, but Dark Knight came out of it, kind of, Woo! sort of, <laughs> out of that That's timeline at least. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. About how much a more amazing of an opportunity and how much more of amazing of an experience that was than um, whatever it was that I was possibly thinking that might be a good opportunity for me. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. None of us do what, what tomorrow, then tomorrow isn't promised to us. We don't know mm-hmm. what's going to happen with our lives, our careers. We just we know that we have to keep trying to do our best and to listen to our hearts and to try and be the best people that we can be and do the best work that we can be. But it's um, that I'm really grateful that I learned to listen to the instinct. One other fun, quick story was I, Mm -hmm. uh, again, being broke. um, (laughs) So we had finished filming animals. Uh huh. I went right away and got got an offer to go be a guest star on a TV show, which ended up giving me like $10,000. So that covered me for a Dang. couple of months. It was great. But then it's December. Mm-hmm. And now I'm back to like having two grand in the checking account going, oh, my God. I wanted, um, you know, to um, – oh, uh, uh, I keep screwing up my stories. Okay. Uh-oh. It's 2000 <laughs> It's 2012. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. It's 2012. I have no money in the checking account. That's right. I had like <laughs> I had like a grand in my checking and I had like um I was really stressed out. Mm-hmm. And it was going into Christmas season and I was planning to propose to Eve that Christmas because I did have the ring I'd gotten um it was an antique ring so it wasn't it was Aww. much more sentimental than than monetarily valuable, right? Yeah. Her mom had helped me um get it it was a really wonderful story and Aww. but i was like i can't propose to this person when i just don't even know <laughs> if being with me is not going to be this like liability and she had always said to me i don't give a crap i don't care i want to be with you no matter what it's not about mm. any of this um but i did get an opportunity out of the blue an offer to be in a film that the director was incredibly passionate about and was mm-hmm. um excited about and it was going to be like some money, not like get rich money, but like maybe like 20 grand. Like it was good. You know, I was like, Oh wow. And yeah, it was that's a lot <laughs> fell in my lap. And I was like, this is incredible. And I read it and I read it and I read it. And I was going to have to leave on like in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't connect with the material. I mm. just, I felt terrible because I didn't know a, how to say, no yet and i also knew that i that this was this this director's dream project and they were mm-hmm. so passionate about it so if i didn't i just the script didn't make sense to me i couldn't really figure out what was you know what it was about or what i was supposed to be doing and i thought if i just take this for the money and i have these negative feelings about this character i'm going to do a bad job and that's not fair yeah. to this guy and so it was very very hard for me but i ended up turning it down and going, you know, like a week later, like, what did I just do? What a fool I am. Because, <laughs> you know, I've always said I got to listen to my gut, but I also have to say yes to every opportunity. Well, mm-hmm. so I'm sitting there on a Monday 
scratching my head going, I don't know what I just did. What a fool. I was um, looking for part-time jobs uh, online and my agent mm-hmm. called me and said, you have, can, this is a really cool project. We just got an audition for you at Barden Schnee casting. Um, we need you to get over there, you know, by in like four hours. Um, oh my gosh. They, they sent me the sides and I loved the scene. It was such a cool scene. Now, mind you, if I had said yes to that other film, I would have been on a plane at that moment right. flying uh, away to go make this movie. And I never would have been able to do this. So I get the sides. I went right into my closet because I knew exactly what this guy looked like. I knew exactly <laughs> what he felt like, what he moved like, how he spoke. I combed my hair. Eve drove me to Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. Go into Barden uh, to the to the office, and and in there is Rich Delia. I don't know if you know Rich. He's a casting director in L.A., but Rich had been an assistant. He now has his own office, but Rich uh-huh. was one of the first people in 2010, 2011. I used to go to all these um, workshops where you, yeah. you get to do a workshop for cast directors, and he had always said when I did his workshop, like, I'm going to bring that guy in someday. Well, he brought me in for this, and it was um, – they were really struggling to find this one character. The whole cast had been had been set for the movie Prisoners. Mm. And I prepared the pants off that role. I mean, I <laughs> knew him through and through. I went in, we did the audition, and um and that and and that movie really did change my life in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I think back like if I hadn't um if I had if I had not listened to my gut on that other project, I never would have done Prisoners. Wow. That's wild. You would have had a completely, possibly a completely different life. Very different. I really believe because again, like I said, Edgar Wright, his awareness of me came from the Dark Knight, certainly, but also prisoners in a big way. And then animals being at South by and and the fact that he put me in Ant-Man, even though he Mm -hmm. ultimately left that film, Peyton Reed kept me and that movie, those movies changed, changed my life. And as, as some fool would say, bigly. (laughs) <laughs> bigly <laughs> that's so cool i love stories like that yeah it's, it's, it's just a it's so nice to hear that when one thing doesn't work out it's because something better is coming around the bend it's true it's true it's really crazy man um yeah wow um before i let you go you have to plug your comic book because <laughs> it's great and i love it thank you um so you know, we all have to be our own, what do we have to be? Our own campaign managers, our own advocates, <laughs> Basically, our own, like, our own you know, chief of to, staffs. Yeah. As, as, you know, creative people, that's our duty. Now, I have been living with this idea about a horror host turned monster hunter for decades. <laughs> and I've been collecting comic books for decades. And I... I work on the TV show MacGyver as the, the villain Murdoch. And... Mm-hmm. I had been writing and writing and thinking about ways I I saw this horror host as superhero, you know, becoming a woman in my mind. And then I started to really flesh out the story about four or five years ago. And I, and my wife, Eve, who I really trust her opinion, always said it was her favorite idea that I had ever come up with. And, um, Mm. and I was on set with the producer, or I was actually at a rap party with the producer from from MacGyver and and, mm-hmm. and, a, and a huge creator of television. And I said, I have this idea for a TV series and um, could I get some advice on how to pitch it? And he asked me to come by his office and I did. And I, and I told him about the idea and he wanted immediately to be a part of it. And he sent it over to dark horse studios and dark horse publishing. Wow. And they, um, they met with me and we, and they said that they were, they loved this idea and they thought it would make a great comic book series and eventually something that we could possibly develop into either um, a television or film project. And Mm -hmm. it's been a dream come true, as you know, since you've read it and I hope everyone out there will get a chance to check it out. It's called Count Crowley, Reluctant Midnight Monster Hunter. It's from Dark Horse Publishing and it is about a woman who wants to be a serious news broadcaster, but becomes uh, the host of the horror creature feature because she is just such a mess. And it (laughs) ends up that the person she replaced was one of the last appointed monster hunters in the world. And we find out if this is just bad luck or if she actually was fated to become a true monster hunter. And, and I love this because it blends all the stuff that I love about 
80s nostalgia, horror host, creature features, monster movies, horror movies, comic books, superheroes, but at the same time, it deals with the issues that really are important to me, which yeah. are addi- addiction, depression, and codependency, and um, and yeah. I, I'm really proud of it. So thank you for letting me give it a shout out. I, I hope of course check it out. Yeah, I, I love your comic book. I love that you have a comic book, and I just, I think that everything you do has a really special flair. And I hope everyone becomes as obsessed with you as they should be. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yes. I, I, yeah, I, I, that's a nice sentiment. Thank you. Yes. And if not obsessed, I hope you guys like me and and we'll check out (laughs) what I do. But I, um, I'm very proud of, you know, 18 years of being clean and sober. If you're listening to this right now and you're struggling and you don't believe it's possible, I believed the same thing. I used to look at myself in the mirror and say the world would be a better place without me. And by the time I was finally able to get the help that I needed, ask for help. It's free. It's out there. You could get sober. You can get mentally healthy. I promise you, we need you in this world. We want you to stay around. We need you to be a part of this with us. And um, I hope I can entertain you in some way during your journey. Oh, man. Now I'm going to go cry. <laughs> Good. Um, where, <laughs> where can people follow you on social media if they aren't following you already? If you if you got about half the alphabet, uh, I my last name is very long, so it's at Dast Malchin, D A S T M A L C H I A N, uh, as Kevin Smith would say, this Smalchin, Dismalchin, Dismalchin, Dave Dismalchin, that's but, yeah, amazing. At Dismalchin, there's also an at Count Crowley on Instagram, and um, be on the lookout for Dune and Suicide Squad coming later Woo-hoo. this year and um, or next year and um, Hopefully you and I can do this many more times, Julian. Yeah, Yeah. again. And hopefully one day we'll be able to have Halloween parties again. Oh, we we will. Were you there? (laughs) Do you remember the seance? Yes, the seance was amazing. (laughs) I just, uh, yeah, I just was looking at pictures of the seance and, um, oh, there's so many fun memories of those parties. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I haven't had like a yearly tarot reading in a few years and I don't even know what to do with my life anymore. We get some good ones, don't we? Yes, so good. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Halloween. My Halloween king. Thank you, David, for coming on to the show. It was so nice to catch up with you. Thank you. Thanks again to David for coming on the show. It's always such a pleasure to catch up with friends on this show. It's It really makes it special for me because, obviously, since we're in this pandemic, I haven't been able to see people. So it's nice that uh, that I'm able to talk to friends. I like it. Tune in next week. Uh, My friend Matthew Underwood is on. You know him from Zoe 101. And there's been lots of reboot talk. So we'll get into that next week. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you're listening to it now. You can also follow us on social media. Those links are in the show notes. And uh, yeah, go vote. Woohoo! We're almost there, guys. Five days, five days, five days. And then I don't know what to do after that. My whole life has been revolved around this election for the past like month. So. Somebody tell me what to do. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell Joe Biden about this podcast, please. (laughs) And as always, thanks for coming in. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Bantwine, wherever podcasts are available.